Okay. Brandon Barton, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. This is great. I'm very excited. I'm very excited. This was a little bit ad hoc, uh, but we talk all the time. So we figured why not record our conversations this time. um, This is uh, just like a normal Friday afternoon, except we're recording this one. So we can't say any of the juicy stuff. We can. And also, oh, okay, you know, okay. I find that and, 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 you know, if you if you drop an F-bomb, I'm not going to yell at you. Um, Thank you. We can edit out or not edit out. But I like to take this opportunity whenever I have my friends on the show uh, is I get to ask things that I didn't know about you. Um, oh, OK. Sure. That that I wouldn't have normally asked because we don't have time usually. So yeah, I was going to say, normally, if you're going to ask me questions that could potentially end our friendship. But now that you're asking me in public, I can't. You no, know, th- we've already gone through it. those things, oh, and okay. I think we got okay. past them. So, but no, <laughs> I know you. Uh, I know you. Uh, I know generally speaking, you went to Cornell. I know you some places yeah. you worked, but like, can yeah. you just give like the the fifty thousand foot airplane level view of like your background, just so sure, um, sure. that I that I that, okay. that maybe I wouldn't know. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to 14 years old, busting tables in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn for the best little burger joint that there ever is uh, called Skin Flints. Um, I was doing this because, uh, you know, I grew up uh, pretty humbly and, and needed money to do anything in life, right? And uh, uh, so I found a job busting tables and uh, that uh, that was my uh, first love of restaurants. Um, I uh, was did bar backing, bartending, probably when I was too young to be doing either of those things, um, and uh, and serving uh, at this beautiful restaurant, uh, Skinflints on Fifth Avenue and 79th Street in Bay Ridge. Um, and then uh, went off to Cornell University, not as a hotel student, which would have made hold, sense, but actually hold, as an hold engineer. Hold on one second, Brandon. Yeah, fire, you, fire. So, because it. I knew you were from Brooklyn. I didn't realize Bay Ridge. So this was, this yes. must have been like 1995 ish, because I know around your age. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, what was the restaurant scene in Bay Ridge in 1995? I mean, you know, if you wanted like a, you know red sauce uh, and and the potential to sit next to um, famous, in, no, it's not famous, infamous people, I should say. And if you don't know what that means, then mm-hmm. you know, sure. Um, then uh, then Bay Ridge was a spot. I mean. Uh, but it's, you know, from, from a, from a culinary perspective, I don't think that there were many James Beard award winning uh, restaurants, um, in, in, um, in the world of Bay Ridge, uh, this burger joint, uh, though, uh, I would say pioneered the idea of in- the English muffin kind of like smash burger, um, oh, yeah. which is just a delicious way to eat a, a, a burger. Thomas's? Uh, Did they use Thomas's? Yeah, hundred percent. Had to. That's a great hand cut fries every buffer. single day. I mean, skin food's still there. It's a it's it's absolutely delicious. Thomas's is such a good English muffin, by the way. Like I like the bays, you know, they're like a little bit fancier and like, but Thomas is like softer and uh, it gets crunchier and it's more like you know I don't know like pliable is the right word, but it's such a good there are muffin. there are a few there are a few um, like food and condiment and stuff such categories that uh, I'm like straight down the middle on. There is no such thing as an English muffin outside of Thomas's in my world. And, you know, just like if I need to put ketchup on something and it's not Heinz ketchup, it tastes weird to me. Um, and, I, and as I, much I as I love it, ho- ho- homemade may- mayonnaise is delicious. But Hellman's is exactly what I want on a sandwich. Sorry. No, I agree. But I mean, I, I will say a good like a good like more like home baked or artisan English muffin has its place, but not for most things, you know. But there are times when it's good, and I think a basil English muffin is actually really good for an egg sandwich, but not not as good for a burger. But oh, really? Heinz ketchup, a hundred percent. Like when I see like Passive. someone made a homemade ketchup, I'm like, can you just also please have Heinz because that's what I'm putting <laughs> on my on my fries. I mean, no, 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 no disrespect to Sir Kensington's, which made a run. You know what I mean? G- great job by them. But like, there's a reason they just too. continued it. You know, there, I mean, it's it's because there's a there's a thing, you know, and yeah, even the folks yeah. who like make their own soda, that's also pretty cool. But Coca Cola is pretty distinct. It's there are pretty... some so, like there's um, I mean, Main Route I think is really good, and then there's sure. there's a there's a Fox and Park out of Connecticut, uh, like yeah. like around the New Haven area. That that's oh, really? really good too. But in terms of a co like a cola, yeah, there's nothing really better than I, 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 I actually, go to the, yeah. I get mad when someone makes another cola because it's like it's just never going to be the same. 
I go to the movie theater. I want a 32 ounce, disgustingly sized, uh, you know, Coca Cola. Yeah. And if you I eat a don't... Domino's pizza, by the way, you have to have Coca Cola. It's the uh, only pairing. Yeah. It's the only pairing. And it just tastes so good together. Yeah. The grease exactly. and the fat. And then mayonnaise yeah. actually have a little bit like, so Hellman's is, is like king, I think, but Duke's is also really good for some things. And, um, I only like a homemade mayonnaise if it's on something that's like, like seafood, where it's like a really sure. rich mayonnaise, and I'm gonna whip it into crab or something like that. But like, for the yeah. most part, yeah, it's just kind of helmets. It's well, so I good. mean, look, you won't catch me, you won't catch me taking French fries and dipping them in in helmets. That's not what it's for for me. But like, if you want to make a sandwich with cheese and meat on it, it's it's kind of has to be helmets. Like, I don't need it to be better. What's than your that. what's your what's your take on on QP mayo? Uh, it's delicious, like incredible. And like, uh, again, fits, fits in the right spot. So like QP mayo, right. Um, uh, is, I mean, isn't the majority, if, if you're making like, um, uh, uh if, if you're making like a spicy tuna roll, QP mayo is what yeah, you're making the, yeah. spi the Sriracha, spicy QP mayo is with, pretty right? much all you, you need and you can add some most. Right. So, so like, I mean, they're again, taste pro profile, sure. Perfect. Uh, and, uh, if I grew up in, you know, Rapanji instead of Bay Ridge, QP would be number one, Yeah, you know? <laughs> All right. Well, we diverge, but uh, I'm yeah, glad we, we diverge. We got okay, that so, so 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 here I am. Uh, now and, and and look, I um I went I went off to college. Uh, you know, to Cornell. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get in. I, I really wasn't even like looking at um, Cornell to go to, and uh, I went in as an engineer. And uh, you know, um, software engineer? found. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Actually, a civil engineer. I wanted to build buildings. Uh, oh, I yeah. wanted to play with yeah. Legos for the rest of my life, like my son nice. does now. Um, Why did you and, transfer to hospitality? Well, here's the thing. I, I I looked around the room about halfway through the semester, and I was like, I don't want to work with these people for the rest of my life. And, and you know, it's really unfortunate um, because I'm sure great people who are still volunteers. That's fine. Um, but I probably should have walked across the, the, the quad to the software engineering side of things. And... Uh, Life, life might have been different as, you know, you and I were graduating around the same time, 2003, 2004. So when companies like Facebook and Google were recruiting software engineers, um, uh, could have been fun. I, I, I don't know if I would have um, been as uh, satiated uh, with wine and, and food as, as my career took me. But uh, anyway, I looked, at, I looked around, around and I said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I can actually have a career in working in restaurants. I don't know if I ever put that together. Something that I had worked for four years and I loved it. And I moved over to, over to the hotel school and um, it was like, uh, you know, it was where I fit. I was just very fortunate to be in a, in the same place that had a hotel school that was arguably the best in the world and um, went through four years of that. And then actually went to go work in actual restaurants, right? Um, not a lot of people from the hotel school at that time would go do that. Many work in real estate today and finance and all this sort of stuff. and. My passion was working in restaurants. I went to go work for Bettina Group at Rock Center Cafe, Seagrill, and The Rink Bar. And for anyone who knows what those are, those are the three restaurants that used to be surrounding uh, the Rockefeller Center Ice Rink yeah. and the Christmas Tree. And you would count, it's almost like you would count in dog years. So if you were there one year, it was kind of like being there three seasons. And so you'd really, it really count as three years on your life. Um, because there, I arguably at the time, there is no busier restaurant in the world than Rockefeller centers, restaurants during, uh, I don't know, it's like November 20th to January 2nd. And we worked every single day of those eight, you know, six to eight weeks every year. Uh, and you were know, front of the house, six, right? 16 hours a day. Yeah. I was front of house. I also did, um, I actually worked in like the receiving department too. So mm -hmm. if you can imagine the amount of fish that would come in, in the morning, to that place, Seagrill especially, uh, yeah. I learned things like salmon smells like cucumber, like really fresh salmon smells like cucumber, clear eyes on the fish, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, healthy gills and, and uh, just really, really cool stuff. And then I, one season I worked, this is actually, this is a good lesson. I'll talk about this story. I worked in a restaurant called Cucina and Company, um, more like a grab and go type of place. And I was in charge of the porters. And I learned one of the best lessons uh, of my career in doing this. First of all, I was humbled as anything because, uh, you know, here I am, you know, oh, I did the grad, got to be doing great things. Let me go, you know, serve in wine and stuff like that. And they had the foresight to to say, hey, this this guy needs perhaps to, to take a little chip off his shoulder and, and go work 
with the Porter team. So, you know, most of the people listening know what Porters do and, and they're uh, some of the backbone of, of, of many restaurants, right? They're making sure that everything stays, stays clean. And I remember getting into a situation where this is just a mess and nobody wanted to do their jobs well and nobody had pride in what they did. And we played a simple game every day. Uh, and, it, you know, it's kind of like uh, giving a gold star, if you will. But at the end of the day, somebody's name went on to a board uh, where below uh, on the top of it, I had who's number one. And so every single day, a new person or maybe the same person uh, would almost like the reverse of going to the doghouse, they would go as who's number one. So everyone's name was on the board and they would go to number one. And so all day, all we talked about, all we you know, go to each other on was who's going to get number one today. And so everyone busted their ass. Everyone worked harder and figured out more efficiencies in like a crazy dish pit or like uh, the timing of getting the floors cleaned or timing of restocking and things like that just to be number one. And I, in those moments, I've learned that um, taking pride in one's job is not just about how much money you make or how much responsibility you have, but just the, the, a recognition that that you can give to people, uh, you know, um, just simply by by telling them that they've done a great job for that specific day. And like, I'll never forget that team. It was just it was so fun to 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 motivate folks who are probably getting least paid in the restaurant uh, to excel at what they're doing. Yeah, it's so interesting. When you said that, I was thinking that you were going to talk about the, the the importance of incentives, you know, like, um, because well, it is, but but not all incentives come with dollar signs. Yeah, yeah. Well, just the the idea that you you know today I, I want to be number one, and that drives me to um, you know uh, to work harder, to to push harder because there's yeah. this like you know um, there's some sort of you know carrot, right? Um, that's I right. Thought, I thought that's, that's where right. you're going, but um, that's interesting. It's so funny, that, like the the lessons we learn in restaurants that have nothing to do with or that have so much more to do with life and business than just like, yeah. you know, I, every restaurant I ever worked in, there's like so many lessons I learned that I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is a life lesson. Not, you know, I remember, I remember the first time I, I was working at Oceana, probably around the time that you were working at Seagrill. It was like 2001, maybe, maybe a little earlier. And, um, Rick Moonen wanted to teach me how to make the, he, well, no, sorry, he didn't want he needed us to make the uh, the crab cake mayo. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, he's gonna show me to make the crab cake mayo. And so he's like, all right, we're gonna make it this morning at 10 a.m. And so I walk out over at 10 a.m. and I'm like, all right, let's make it. He's like, where the fuck's Mise Plus? I was like, oh, I'll go get it. He's like, kid, you're not in school anymore. If you wanna learn, you gotta do the work. And and there was that's basically all he said, and he walked away. He might have thrown something at me too. And I was like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> we don't just get to learn, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You you have to put in effort to learn. You have to put an extra effort to learn, and it's not just going to be given to you, especially when you start to go in, you know, into any craft. And uh, like from then on, I was like, "Oh yeah, if I'm going to learn, I got to go like I got to go above and beyond everyone else. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be in the same playing field." Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, you know, for all the, um, you know, there's such a sports analogy here too. You know, I mean, we, we could go into a little bit of this cause just, um, you know, I was an athlete in college, but like, but, Baseball, um, right? uh, no basketball, basketball. basketball that's on. right. You, you, you know, me. that's right. I was actually I'm, Googling I'm that tall, before. Tall baseball player I was trying time. to find yeah. a picture of you at Cornell basketball. I, I there was something you, you came up for Brooklyn basketball, Wow. But I couldn't, and you came up for Cornell, but there was no pictures. We don't, I was like, we don't need, I need a need picture of Brandon you 20 want, years you want ago. Me, do you want me to just start pulling pictures of your past? No. Um, I mean, so uh, any in any case, um, I was just going to say, you know, there's so many things that were done wrong back then from a management standpoint. Like you, you threw in the, and he probably threw something at me, right? Uh, and you and I both know that. And our, those things are bad. Um, and those things are really bad. We don't need, probably you and I are not the ones to necessarily go and cover that. Um but I will say in some, in some disciplined um, uh, styles of management that you do find in sports and that you do find in a kitchen, um, there are a lot of beautiful things that come of it. And, you know, look, I'm sure we, you and I would talk about this at some point during the, the pod, but, um, you know, our, our guy, Floyd Cardoz, was one of those chefs who was able to have incredible strong leader, leadership without being a guy throwing pots and pans at people, um, at least from, from the perspective that I had. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, yeah he was in the trenches. Know. So he, oh, he, he, made, would, he, he was in the weeds with like... you. He, 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 he would yell at you and then put his arm around you and tell you, this is why I just yelled at you, you know? Um, uh, you know, so, uh, there's a way, there was a way to do it. I just, I, I, I actually do find myself as a leader now, um, trying to think about the lessons that I was able to learn in those harder management scenarios, yeah. uh, because they, they really did forge me into having, uh, more resilience in essence. Yeah. Well, I want to definitely talk about like your leadership style, uh, as a CEO. Um, but before we get into that, I also, of course, want to, want to hear about Byte. But oh, you, yeah, sure. you, went, you, you went to Cornell and I was talking about this with Kristen Barnett last season. And, yeah. you know, when I was at Tabla, this swarm of people came in from Cornell at all at once, <laughs> Randy Garudi and Will Gadara and uh, John Hoff. Vandergriff and uh, all the, all these. And I'm like, who are these, who are these people? And why are they yep. all coming here and working at once? And then fast forward, they're like, what is it about Cornell that creates so many great um, hospitality professionals? Yeah. I mean, um, Look, I, I don't know if I know the, the real um, uh, secret sauce here. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, to, to call the hotel program a trade school is wrong. But in, in one way, it's a really great way to understand the dynamic. It is attracting people who want to spend their lives doing something related to hospitality, the same way that culinary school attracts people who want to be chefs, right? It's not a surprise that you're going to get great chefs uh, out of this school. I think um, one of the things that, that Cornell has done so well is to have incredible professors who are passionate about the industry and to put the focus not just on what goes on in the classroom, but to also have operational experience. And so the, the, there's a, a part of the program where you actually have to work in restaurants. That's great. Um, or sorry, not restaurants, but in the hospitality, you could, you could fulfill this by working in a hotel or working in restaurants. So you're, it's mandated that you one summer, you got to go and do an internship. Um, and uh, it is lauded. And the people, the students that are there, um, understand who are the who are the badass other students, right? The ones who have gone and worked and done internships for Union Square Hospitality Group or Shake Shack, or gone and like, you know, staged at the French Laundry for the summer or something like that at the time, right? Uh, although, you know, that'd be pretty cool now as well. Um, and and you know you 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 strive for that you strive to do that rather than go back to your hometown and work in skinflints for the summer that's not the point you want to go work as uh front desk of the four seasons and i think that the network is incredibly important um hotel students and hotelies as we call ourselves um always will open doors for other hotelies because of the shared experience that we've gone through um and so Immediately upon meeting a Randy Garuti, I didn't go to school with him, but we had we had an instant connection because of uh, Cornell. Same thing with Will Gadara. Same thing with uh, all those folks um, who have now gone on to like I don't know, be the names that we all look up to in the hospitality industry. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, after all, after all your time in the restaurants, you are you moved on to tech, with Resi, the fourth employee at Resi, I think, and then. And now you're the CEO of Byte. So can you, can you talk yeah. a little bit about what, what is Byte? Also, why yeah, sure, did you sure, end sure. up there and, and, and what do you all yeah. doing? So Byte is um, uh, the leader of software for self-service kiosks. So we're trying to solve the labor problem in the industry uh, at the same time of um, creating a path for hospitality to uh, live in a digital world. So uh, imagine you've walked into uh, a McDonald's or a Taco Bell or a Bluestone Lane, uh, you know, or, or a, a Togo's or any of these customers. Some of them are customers, some of them are places uh, that, that have built their own kiosks. Um, walk in and order off a screen. Um, and, and what's beautiful about it, in my mind, is that this is a necessity for the industry as the pressures against the P&L continue to, to uh, be there, whether that's food costs, labor costs, and so forth. Um, but my goal is to take some of the things that that I learned in the industry from Patina Group, from Danny working for Danny Meyer at Tabla, as we we um, uh, alluded to, and bring them into the digital experience. Um, when I think about going to a fast, casual, or a quick service restaurant, um, most of the time you're not going to be recognized, and I think that there are just ways that we can start using technology to recognize guests, to give um, to give incentives to guests to come back. Um, to maybe even like speed up a transaction for them. Um, and all these things are little little parts of the hospitality experience while allowing 
uh, the the people who work there, the, the the employees, to not sit there and just take an order, which anyone can do, but actually add to the experience, refill a drink in the dining room, clean a table, uh, pull out a chair for somebody. Um, it's um, it, it's a beautiful thing when you start to to put real hospitality even at this lowest price point in our industry uh, of, of food. So um, yeah, really, really proud of what we've done. We're a series A company, so we're along the way now and um, we see a pretty bright future ahead for for, uh, for Byte. So, um, you know, as it relates to kiosks, I mean, it's interesting to say like, you, you, so that's, I have not heard you say that before that you, we want to recognize the guests and it's actually really poignant. Like, yeah, when you go to, when you go to, it doesn't matter who you are. If you go to a Shake Shack somewhere, no one knows who you are. Like, unless you are like uber famous, you know, no one's, no one's going to recognize you. You, <laughs> sure. you could be a, an incredibly well, you know, re regarded, you know, hospitality professional that if you went into uh, you another could be restaurant. A, you could be, you could be a five time a week regular and the staff turns over so much that maybe they don't recognize you as well. True. So, so, so how do you, how do you do that? What are the, yeah. what are the mechanisms in place to recognize somebody? Yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a great question. So uh, since the, since the beginning of Byte, we've always had facial recognition built into our platform. If a restaurant wants to use it, um, it's not a mandated thing. Um, but uh, you can utilize, uh, you know, very off the shelf cameras to, um, to recognize who the person is who's coming up and maybe recall their last orders. The beauty of the way we do it is that we're not trying to get, take anybody's personal identif uh, identifiable information or anything like that and tie it together, um, but just trying to say, hey, this person came in last time, here's the things they've ordered, maybe they want this sandwich again without mayo or without yeah. this or without that. Um, another way is there's such an increasing um, call from the industry to have um, um, really uh, dynamic loyalty programs, okay? If you ask the most fast, casual, and, and QSR operators, a really important metric of the, of the marketing team is how many people are part of our loyalty program? What percentage of our guests are loyalty orders? Um, usually there's like an 80-20 rule in there where that makes up the majority of their revenue is people that go often. And so um, even if it's not using biometrics or facial recognition and some of these other things, uh, the, the idea to type in your phone number or type in, um, uh, you know, or, or scan your phone or something like that to identify who that person is so that I could, as a software company, perhaps look at your whole history of ordering and give you the best suggestions that you want that are personalized to you, give you a personalized experience, show the rewards that are available to you um, and, and give you that kind of recognition, so, so to speak, digitally. Um, that's really powerful. And the more that the industry moves towards, and this is not for fine dining, this is for you know the casual the, or, or the uh, fast casual and QSRs. The more that we move towards a hundred percent digital ordering, the more these magical experiences will be unlocked. I know that Chick Shack's a great example. It's a it's a brand that you and I both love, right? Um, I have ordered Shake Shack in a hundred different ways, uh, in person, uh, order ahead on their website, order ahead from their app order ahead, uh, you know, on maybe a DoorDash or delivery from DoorDash uh, or any of the partners, or it used to be Caviar and any of the partners that they have. Um, so, but I, I know that it's very hard for a restaurant like Shake Shack to take all of those different things and tie it all to Brandon. But that's the goal so that they know who I am. So they know that I don't really eat, you know, uh, uh, you know, doubles anymore. I'm never, <laughs> I'm, ne I'm never putting extra meat on, on my, uh, on my food anymore. And maybe even occasionally I'm, you know, throwing in a Chicago dog or a bird dog, um, to get the vegetarian side of things. Right. So, um, as my preferences have changed over the 20 years of being a Shake Shack fan since the first one, you know, um, uh, you know, digitally, they should be able to track that and give me suggestions based off of what I want. Um, uh, we're not there yet. But there's a lot of people that are that are working on this particular problem to try to help utilize this digitalness to make some really beautiful experiences out of it. Yeah, it's a that's a huge challenge. We you know, we we worked on that when, when, before me when I was running Orify. Just how do you unify the customer's data because they're using different credit cards or a credit card expires and they buy online, they buy in person, they 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 pay cash, they. It's yeah. really difficult. There are some some great CDP companies that are that are that are working on it right now. Do you do you partner with any of them right now to try to? Or, or yeah. Work on so some of that yourself, I mean, or? Uh, 
Yeah, the the uh, the truth is is that we do partner with some, uh, you know, uh, others that we want to, like people like Vicky, uh, you know, even wisely on the back end of Olo, uh, you know, they they do all do great work. Um, the truth is is that we Bytes connection is to the point of sale system, and then usually it's the point of sale system that's connecting to them, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. we got to we're kind of the tip of the spear that has to yeah. get that information yeah. to go all the way back to where it belongs. Um, what's, you know, what we're working on, you know, and maybe this is, yeah, here we go, breaking news. But we're, what we're working on is um, getting information back from CDPs because the return is what's important. I want to know, in order to give Josh a personalized experience on the kiosk, I want to know what Josh has ordered when he was ordering online two weeks ago, right? And maybe put that same order up. Uh, if you're doing meatless January, I just made that up. Is that a thing? Great. Meatless January, you know, I want to just put your order up from two weeks ago so that you can just click one thing and reorder. Um, you know, one of the one of the beauties of these third party aggregate uh, third party delivery companies like DoorDash and Uber Eats is that they have your order history sitting right there. And if you're the type of person that orders the same Indian food on Thursday nights and that's what the family wants, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to do it. I'd want that same ease of experience, uh, you know, on a kiosk. Yeah, you know, it's interesting the. I, I think about this sometimes. I live in northern Westchester, and there's northern Westchester. If you're listening, there's nothing up here. Like, <laughs> there, like we, you know, there, there's not a lot of options. Um, <laughs> but what I'll say is, when I go, you know, my when my wife and I decide we're going to order something, you know, to get delivered, we go on DoorDash. I would love it if they were like, "Hey, you've ordered this like twelve times. Do you want to try something different? Here's this." <laughs> because yeah, sure. you end up getting stuck in the same, um, you know, yep. uh, in the same thing, and, and and very likely there's probably something else. And you know, humans are creatures of habit, and so we that, that's part of what we we like. But do you ever think about like how can you create net new experiences for that customer as opposed to just? I mean, just it's like it's like it's like you're throwing the alley oop to me, man. Um, so again, since the, since the beginning of the company, the, uh, our CTO Stas, uh, co-founder of the company, um, incredibly bright and, and this is before it became a buzzword, but we've been using AI the whole time to make suggestions to people. And what's beautiful about the AI that, that we're using and the machine learning that we're using is it's not just about, um, perhaps like item X. We also can see because we're telling the guests what's in the item. Right, uh, I'm telling you that a side paneer has spinach and paneer cheese and this and that. Um, uh, we might take some of those attributes and then that feeds into what the suggestions will make. So if the item is spicy, and we see that you you partic you're particular to like spicy items, we might suggest something that's spicy. Um, and AI does a great job of this. Uh, AI does a really great job of taking. A bunch of things that don't need, seemingly need have a connection and spit out something that could potentially have a connection to it. Item correlation, category correlation, all this stuff. So, yeah, uh, I, I love the idea that we are uh, are making suggestions to people that uh, of items that they may not have thought of, right? And I and and to to just double down on the point, I don't think this happens if you just have a static menu board. You walk into a restaurant, you see the menu board, you order the same thing you want. There's not an opportunity to show you other things that are available in a, you know, in a controlled and personalized way. Yeah, yeah. Because I, if I could control where your eyes look, I'd say, "Hey, Josh, look over there." Yeah, you yeah, like you're almost, cheeseburgers. You're almost personalizing a menu for every single person that comes in the door. Yeah, it's it's um it is uh there's something special about it. There's something special about giving somebody recommendations that are not just any recommendation. Do you want fries with that is the worst possible question, right? Um, maybe you already have fries. Why are you asking me that? And yeah. so uh, there's a lot to learn here, you know? Um, and, and, I, and I think people over index on this, but uh, a good friend of mine, Mike Lukianov, also a Cornell guy, he's one of the leaders of data science in, in the uh, restaurant tech space. Um, he, he has a new company that he's doing, great, great dude. Um, uh, but he always talks about like just making it simple. You know, um, uh, you don't have to have the, the the data science do all the work, but you know, drinks sides are good complements to entrees. You know that if somebody has a drink aside and an entree, dessert category works too, right? <laughs> um, so uh, make make some hard to, make some kind of harder rules in there too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about the 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 hardware? Because you got your your yeah. it's hardware and software. Is there are there innovations happening on the on the hardware side as well? Yeah, we um, so you know uh, we're fortunate that 
uh, we are a software company and can work with a lot of different hardware partners. You know, that includes people like Elo who uh, do incredible touchscreens. They, uh, companies actually, they actually invented the touchscreen over 50 years ago. Um, that's like, you know, the patents for the touchscreen, they invented, not Apple, not somebody else. They invented the touchscreen, the company. So uh, they kind of know what they're doing there. Um, the uh, the innovations on on the um, on the hardware side are coming in form factor lighter faster okay that stuff which everyone would expect from computers uh, but also on the payments and reading uh, NFC reading RFID um, you know RFIDs aren't going to go on food anytime soon but um, there's all this um, let's say structural technology like NFCs which everyone has on your phone whether you know it or not. Uh, you have you have the ability to tap your phone to do things. Uh, when I think about personalization in the in the future, Josh, why not walk up to a screen and just tap it with my iPhone and it knows who I am? Why do I have to put yeah. in a phone number at CVS, right, to to tell you my loyalty? It should know from this thing that's in my pocket. So I, you know, I love um, you know uh, when when the hardware is starting to do things to connect the person to the experience. Yeah. Another good example of this, by the way, is Amazon uh, using the Palm payment, probably at a Whole, F Whole Foods near you. Um, I spoke to two people who are over 70 years old uh, this weekend who said they love using it because they just like don't want to fumble around with their wallet and trying to get a credit card out. I think credit cards are pretty easy to use myself, but uh, but like I love the idea that it's cross generational and and like just using your palm is another way to take yeah. hardware and make it a part of a new part of this experience. Yeah, you know it's funny. Like I I mean I, I don't think I've carried cash in like eight nine years something like that. It's a it's a it's a it's a problem actually because I never have cash. But now I never even carry my credit card because I have an I have a, I have a watch. I have a phone yeah. and 90% of the time I'm just paying by like putting my watch in front of something and that's how I pay. Yep. And you know, what, <laughs> what's the purpose of carrying around these little, and I imagine that's going to carry over to, you know, to these kiosks and things as well of yeah. other things that we can do. Um, I mean, if it, and if it's retina scan and you know who I am, um, yeah, why do we even need a phone? Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, well, that, that's coming too. I mean, uh, everyone's probably, uh, you know, um, uh, seen scary, the lines. Sorry? Can be scary, but. <laughs> well, look, but um, I was going to say everyone's seen the lines at the airport for clear. Okay. That's retina scanning. That's thumbprints. That's all the things. I, I'm not scared of that. I actually I actually somewhat appreciate the idea, even in, in some of the um, the airlines that are now allowing you to board by scanning your face or even come into the country on global entry by scanning your face, kind of appreciate the security level there rather than a, an ID that I got faked when I was 16 years old, uh, you know, by Jimmy down the street, right? Um, uh, so yeah. uh, some of these things, when done right, and that's not always the case. Like I, I, I could, I could understand tech, tech doesn't always, uh, tech companies don't always do the right thing when it comes to protecting this information, but we do, and. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and I think that there's a path for using this stuff uh, in the future to make people happier. Cool, man. Well, let's, let's maybe, I'd love to talk a little bit like nuts and bolts about y your, how you operate. Um, yeah, sure. So in terms of like being the CEO of a startup tech company, right? Yeah. I'd love to understand, you talk, we were talking about your leadership style, but like you're also an exceptional sales leader. So there's all these factors that 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 um, sort of make you who you are as a leader, right? You have this hospitality yeah. experience, you have a restaurant experience. You're you're an incredible sales leader. You've helped me in tons of ways. You're also a parent, right? Which is mm. a, 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 we can both you know speak for how much that Relate impacts that, us as sure. a leader. But like, who are you as a leader, and how do those things play into um, you know how you lead your team? Yeah, um, I mean, first and foremost, I'd love to think, and and this is perhaps. Uh, I'm going to idealize. So if my team's listening to this. I'm sure there's going to, you, you could poke, poke holes in this. I'm not a perfect leader. I know that. And I'm, I, and I'm on the path to try to be, that's for sure. Um, I'd like to think of myself as a servant leader for sure. Um, the idea that my job is to be in service to the team around me to help them do their job better. Um, I, as a CEO, you have the most general role in the entire company. You basically oversee everything all at once. And so you might, in certain areas, be the only one with the purview to see how things are interconnected. Um, and so 
Uh, my job is to put great leaders in the heads of their roles, help them to understand what to do, and and then help them to do it. Um, and so I, I hope I execute on that, and I know I try every every day to do that. Um, I also view myself as uh, somebody who wants to think about my team first. Um, it's really important that our customers are happy, but in a very Danny way, um, take care of your people. Uh, and um, the team around me, if I don't take care of them, how could they take care of uh, our customers correctly? Um, yeah. What do you, you know, do? But, um, yeah. What do you do when, when someone makes a mistake? What's your what, how, do you, how do you handle it? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, there, there's some old adages here. Um, uh, you know, I I do my best not to. Um, uh, you know, uh, I or I guess the adage is praise in public. Uh, you know, discipline in private. Okay, and so um, I'm I'm never one to try to call out um, uh, any behaviors that. Uh, I don't like seeing in public, um, but the first thing I do is try to understand why did somebody do that, do it? Um, you know, there might be a reason that I don't understand. I remember this is, uh, goes back to Tracy Wilson and Terry Coglin, GMs of Tabla. Uh, yeah, somebody shows Tracy. up. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Shout out Tracy Wilson. First time I'm sure for the pod, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, when somebody shows up to the restaurant, uh, who works for you, a busboy or something, or, or, or a server shows up 20 minutes late. You don't ask them. Um, you know, uh, what happened? The first thing you say is, how are you? Is everything okay? Right? You don't know if that person got in a uh, car accident, a bike accident, got mugged on the way in, who knows? Uh, and I think the same thing applies when somebody makes a mistake. Hey, I noticed you did this this way. Tell me why you did it that way, right? And say, okay, this is the way that I think it would be done better and here's why. And, and you owe that explanation to people um, as to why you think it could be done a different way. It's it's so fun in my mind that we now have this like remote culture. You know, by the way, sales always has. Uh, I laugh at the remote culture stuff because when I was at Resi, I, I managed people, um, you know, all across the country and interacted with people all across the globe. Um, we had a team member in Australia who I brought into Resi, and uh, you know, I was on the phone with her weekly uh, talking about sales strategies and stuff. Right. So, um, but I, I I love you know especially at, at the team with uh, with the team at Byte. Um, we have people that have come up with different personalities and some people like direct feedback. Some people like, uh, you know, to be a little bit more indirect with it or soft. The people who might like, um, softer feedback when direct feedback comes at them feel like it's aggression. The people that, um, you know, then there's like passive aggressiveness potentially. It's a really interesting dynamic to try to deal with. And, and man, I'm, you know, as a first time CEO, uh, it's fun for me to, to try to figure this all out. And I don't do it alone, by the way. I mean, like I, I should give a shout out to, um, you know, the mentors that I've had um, uh, along the way from from people like Will Gadara, uh, who, who I call in my time of crises, uh, to Jim Tenner, who's uh, on my my independent on my board, but also uh, a good friend of mine, Sam Jacobs, who um, runs the Pavilion Group. You, you, you and I have talked about that a bunch. Like he's uh, the Pavilion Group and um, and what they do uh, in terms of crafting sales leaders, marketing leaders, and then they have this thing called CEO Pavilion, which has just been unbelievable for me to to have access to reach out to people who are like series b series c badass three times ceos um who i can talk to and just say hey i just i this is the the issue that i'm uh coming up against what can i do about it you know yeah yeah having those having those platforms are so helpful i i have a um um a shout out here there's a, there's a platform called hampton and it's, uh, yeah. it's sim similar, and it's just a bunch of uh, of CEOs of, of of different types of companies. You have to have a certain amount of revenue to get there, um, but it's it's awesome. And Sam Parra and, and his team has put together this really uh, uh, like amazing platform, and it's just so helpful to be able to ask questions. and And we're all, you know, any in any of these these cases, you know, there's a bit of an island. You know, you feel like you're on an island, and so like having having that that help is really is really great. I feel like this is going to be like a broken record because I. Yesterday, I was interviewing a uh, really awesome chef named Evan Hennessy, and we were talking about the same exact thing. Oh, wow. And I had a, you know, um, the broken record here is that I, I said this yesterday, but whatever. Um, I had a 360 review, and and one of the one of the things that was most clear was like I don't ask why enough. Uh, I just jump yeah. right to the thing is how we're going to fix this, and and um, and it's funny because I have a pretty like steadfast philosophy philosophy that like everything is my fault, right? So like if yeah. anything goes wrong in the company that somebody did, I either 
hired the wrong person. I didn't train them right. I didn't manage them the way that they're supposed yeah. to be managed, or I didn't like, you know, motivate them the right way. And it's so funny how, um, how often when things go wrong, it's, it's so difficult to, to remember that right in the yeah. moment, like, wait a second, what's going on? What, why did this person do this? I wonder what's going on yeah. either personally or because of the frameworks that we've set up for making decisions or the, 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 the environment that we cre created that like could be better. Like what was it that caused this mistake? Because it's yeah. not very often that someone is just not good or yeah. is a bad person. It's, they might right, be in the right. wrong role, but, um, it's up to us to like create, you know, and, and learn every time one of these mistakes happen, we learn how we need to make it better, not just them. And it's, well, well that's one of the most fun know, the, parts about being a CEO is, is, is that. The, the thing that I took from, from what you just said that I, I wonder if it's a nugget you have ever thought about, you said you think about, um, how often oh, you, so you, you think that everything is like something that you've done wrong. Right. But I wonder, I really wonder if your employees know that you're thinking that in the background. Because if, if if your actions were to them, with them, had the context of like a sign above you that said, I was wrong about this, and you were doing the same thing, they probably would react differently, because, but they don't know that it's sitting there. And you're like, fuck, I did this wrong. And this is like, this is why I'm reacting so quick to it, because I hate doing things wrong. And I, you know, like, yeah. it's, uh, you know, there's like this, this context that other people don't have. By the way, I should say the thing, um, you know, uh, this is like the Richard Crane and or Tracy Wilson's mm -hmm. line of ask the question mm -hmm. before you say the thing. That's the most succinct way in my mind to deal to to uh, to say, how do you deal with problems? Make sure you ask the question first before you jump in with the solution, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it, it has a huge huge impact, you know, when something, something does go wrong that you didn't expect, right? Cause it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean they did something wrong. It's just not the thing that you expected them to do. Um, yeah. just ask why, because yeah. typically what ends up happening is you're like, oh, wow. I didn't even think about that. You would go there or that that's the, you had these concerns and that's why you did this, or you were trying to do this. Like no matter what, it's not necessarily, yeah. I think it's a little negative to say like, I'm wrong in these situations, but it's my responsibility to create the environment where everyone is, you know, meeting yeah. expectations. And if they're not, it's v not very often that it's because of them, you know? No, 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 no. It's definitely, it's definitely not. And, and, and 99% of people that, that work with you and for you want to do a job well. Yeah. <laughs> they want to do yeah, it great. Exactly. They're, they're, tr they're, they're they, if they're doing something, it's not because they're trying to screw something up. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> by the way, sometimes well. that's what, and that's why it really is like either for me, it's either you hired the wrong person for the wrong job, didn't manage them well, didn't train them well, or you didn't motivate them. And the first one is the hardest one, right? Because sometimes they are not meeting expectations and it's not because, um, it, 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 it is that it's not right, right? Like they're, they're not doing the right thing. They're not you yeah. know, executing the way that need, they need to execute, but it might be because you just hired the wrong person. And that's the sure. worst because yeah. that's the hardest one because it's still on you, but you have to, you know, handle you that. You have to make a change. Yeah. yeah. And it's not their fault typically, you know, unless, yeah. you know, I mean, t unless they sort of, you know, made it very clear and that this is something they're very good at. And there was a, a, it's very difficult to test that and you didn't test it ahead of time. Sure. You know, but even then it's, you can test most things anyways. Yeah. So <laughs> on leadership, the other thing that I'd love to, you and I talk about our kids a lot and yeah. it is not easy having two kids. It is not easy having two kids and having a job. It is not nope. easy having two kids and being the CEO or a, 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 an operator of any kind. But I'm curious for you, what are what are the things that you've learned from being a parent that that make yeah. you a different? Uh, I don't want to say better, but like that changed the way that you lead your team. Yeah, for sure. Uh, look, a lot. I think I think you know the, the 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 comparison here. None of my team is not my children, right? Let's let's say that flat out. And let's also just really clearly state, um, I am not the CEO of my house. That belongs to <laughs> that belongs to the four, my four year old Jane Barton, who is unequivocally, she's probably co CEO with my wife of my home. Um, uh, that woman is a force of nature, and uh, if you uh, if you come across her 
in, in, in the future, you will be lucky because she has fire to give, man. It's, uh, it's awesome. But I'm not the CEO of my house. But um, what, uh, what's great about kids is that they're, you know, uh, by, by nature, they're naive to the world. Right. And so, so even silly things, um, I, uh, I said to my, uh, my, you know, it's a snowing here in Connecticut and icy everywhere. And so my son uh, goes to kindergarten and uh, I said, did you play this game at, at, um, uh, at break, uh, you know, whatever they call it, recess, sure. Um, and uh, he said, no, we're not allowed to do that, that and that because there's ice on everything. And I said, oh, there's ice on all the equipment. And then like, you know, we, we keep talking. And about three minutes later, he comes back, he goes, dad, what's equipment? <laughs> right? It's like, um, and I, I, you know, this is uh, the, the analogy extended to conversation my sales team was having with my product team today. And, you know, we're talking about specific things within products uh, that you know, one team saying this word and using it this way and the other team saying the same word and they're both using it completely different ways that that don't mean the same thing in uh, to each other. And, uh, you know, uh, being really clear about communication, uh, you know, is is one of those things. I'll just give you a second example with the kids that, that I like um, wholeheartedly understand now is my kids get really disappointed, especially my, my oldest, when he doesn't do the right thing. And what you know half the time that he may be accused of not doing the right thing you know it's because we didn't tell him what the right thing to do was i didn't know what to do why are you yelling at me i didn't know i was supposed to put my shoes right over there or not walk in the house with muddy shoes on or yeah and he didn't because he's never done that before because he's never yeah uh, you know uh he's never been on a train before he didn't know you you can't you know change seats or something um and so you got to tell people what their job is. You got to tell them, help them to understand how they do it. And, and then you can expect things of it. You know, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. you can't do that unless you, they know what to do and what their job is. No, it's so true. And, and you know, I mean, there's, I, I feel like there's countless, the, the, the naivete is a big one, you know, because it helps you, at least for me, it helps you, it helps me separate the person from the problem with my team yeah. because you know with a child when they do something wrong you love your child you're never going to be right. like what the what the you know like what the heck what you know you don't yell at them you're like hey that's hey man that's you, we don't do that you know we don't we don't hit i know you, it's okay to be angry but it's not okay to hit right and they're not a a hitter they are a person you love and they hit someone and there's a reason why they have these feelings mm -hmm. that they're tr so trying to work on. it's the same thing with your team right like if something happens you know they still are great and it's something that they did you know is outside of, you know, them that we need to sort of, you know, explore. I think that is like, um, yeah. you know, it's huge. And the other one, there's a book I love that, um, uh, shout out to Adam Schaefer. He's the one that, that, that told me about this, but um, it's called The One Minute Manager. And oh, sure. the basic uh, premise um, is, you know, just like, you know, go after compliments, right? Like you need to, uh, you know, find- Who's the author? I forget the name of the author. No, I, I, um, so so I so okay. To say the explanation. Well, you know, uh, the, yeah. Generally speaking, it's just like you, you need to you know find every reason to um to find the good to 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 you know like you 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 really basically you want to like compliment people often, right? And you see it so clearly in children that you never use negative motivation, right? It's like when they're yeah. starting to learn how to go bathroom or they're learning how to read, you're just any little thing. You're like, great job, great effort, great effort. You're like, you're constantly doing that. And it's the same yeah. with people, you know, you have to, yeah. and I, it's something I struggle with because I didn't grow up with it. Like I grew up the opposite, but like I try so hard to like, to, to, as, as much as I can to do it. We have like this kudos yeah. channel in our, in our Slack, you know, that the, the, the whole team uses as well. And it's like that positive reinforcement, I know it sounds silly, but it's so important. And you yeah. see it so clearly when you have children. Yeah, I, I, I agree so much. We have a shout out channel on Slack. We do the same thing. It's Ken Blanchard. And uh, I'll tie two things back to our, our the earlier part of our conversation. One is I did a I did a one day seminar that was a one credit or one weekend, maybe seminar that was a two one credit class at Cornell. Ken Blanchard teaching the one minute manager. So, oh, wow. you know, 20, 20 years ago, how far ahead of the curve? Like, why is Cornell great? It's, you know, they, they were recognizing people like that back then. Uh, to do those things. And, uh, and I think that that one minute manager mentality, it's exactly the who's number one, who's number one today, 
you know, and, and nobody ever felt bad about being number two, but, and, you know, but it was like, it was always like, you oh, know, great job doing that. Great job doing this. And you know, that high paced, you know, everyone asks, I'm sure how many people have asked you, oh, is it really like the bear restaurants? And I'm like, kind of, you know, it can be, <laughs> uh, it's this high paced environment and startups are the same thing. It, like, stop, take that one minute, say, thank you. Say, we, I appreciate you. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and it obviously applies all the way to children. Yeah. And look, I'd be remiss not to, not to think about, you know, uh, you and I have spoken a little bit about this. My wife, uh, also is somebody who works as a mother and I totally recognize the incredible amounts of pressure that are put on, uh, mothers who work at the and, and mothers who don't, by the way, clearly, but mothers who have jobs and mothers who work and have careers, um, that's even more than what's the, than what society puts on, uh, men to do this. So absolutely, um, yeah. I don't want to sound at all like I'm complaining because, um, you know, when the school alert is only sent to the mothers and not to the fathers too, it's clearly society saying, um, you know, this is your responsibility, which is full, but, um, we have a long way to come before, um, you know, I know that the, you know, that the, the women that decide to have a family and work have the same level of, of equity uh, in the workplace uh, when it comes to levels of responsibility in the, in the home life too. So yeah, yeah, and even if they if they don't work, I mean, my oh the, my gosh, it is it is just anyone has kids knows this. It's just harder for the mom, no matter what. Yeah. I mean, obviously, even after birth, which is of course all, all of that, but even as the kids grow, especially these first like you know three, four, or five years, they just gravitate to the mom so much more and the mom has so much more like put on her. It's just, um, it's tough. I mean, I, I, I in, really in, like in, it, in you know? cisgender relationships, uh, inclusive of everybody, but there's always a, there's always a, uh, uh, a member of the family who, who will get oh, more. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. That's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm living in my bubble. Um, but you're right. Um, okay. So kind of moving on, uh, from leadership and, and parenting and how, how it relates to it. I want to talk about startups because you were talking about your Series A startup and yeah. um, a couple things. One, sure. let's talk a little bit about like what it's like to be a venture-backed startup. Sure. And, and then a little bit about like your experience raising capital. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, we'll talk uh, a little bit about both. Uh, uh, the venture-backed part is easier for me to understand because I've done that a couple times. Uh, raising capital, this is my first rodeo at raising capital. So uh, I don't claim to be an expert. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but, um, you know, I think, <laughs> you know, maybe this is such self-selection, okay, right? But I actually think that everybody in their career should work in restaurants at some point. And I think also everybody in their career should find, doesn't necessarily need to be venture backed, but find a startup to go work in. I think working in, in an environment with three, four, five people only working on a big problem together is such a, an enriching experience to your life. Um, people say, you know, throughout the word entrepreneur in a, a lot of different ways. If you do that, if you're one of the first two people, three people, five people, on it, you're an entrepreneur. There's no question about it. You, you have taken that, that journey whether it's your name on the front door or not. And I think you can really find out a lot of things. It might not be for everybody, but it's something to try. Um, uh, and Hold on, man. That's, um, that's such a good point that I never thought yeah. about. And I don't even know if it's the first three, four, or five, because I have a small team. We're like 30 some people. Like, yeah, if you're in a startup, you are taking a leap. And mm -hmm. that's very entrepreneurial. Like that's, I've never thought about it that way, but yes, they, they're, they're all entrepreneurs because they are taking a leap. They're taking, you know, equity in, 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 you know, having a vested interest in this company succeeding and, 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 you know, taking, um, a risk. That's, yeah. that's huge. I never, I never thought about that. That's so, that's so smart, man. I, I yeah, will disagree like a little bit in that. Like, I actually don't think that everyone should, because there are a lot of people that startups are just not right for you. Sure. Right? If you need a lot of structure, if you thrive on, um, well, on structure and not on autonomy, and you thrive on a very clear set of, of um, a, a, a very clear Rules. roadmap of like, this is it, then you, you might not be right for a startup. And that's okay. That's totally okay. We, we need those people as well. Um, but if, you, if you're in a startup, you have to be okay with the ambiguity um, because it doesn't, you know, you're just not going to, you know, be happy if you, if you don't. Yeah. 
What's your job description? I don't know. Um, these three things this week, but uh, who knows yeah, the, next week? The minute you start hearing early on in the startup from someone like, that's not my job, then you know Oof. that's that's not a, you know, that, that, that's, that, that doesn't mean that they're wrong or bad. It means, it, you know, it just might not be the right time for them to be at this company. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I, I guess my point is simply, if, you, if you've always loved structure and stayed in structure, how do you know if you'd like something that isn't, you know, go, go taste it, um, you know, uh, go, go try it for three months. And, you know, again, maybe it's harder to get these jobs, uh, but, um, you know, not dissimilar to, uh, to, to the world of, of, um, of restaurants, like having a small team, very entrepreneurial, all trying to achieve the same goal under frankly, extreme pressure. And that's where the VC part of it comes in. Um, there, you know, everyone, <laughs> everyone lauds over the people who raise a lot of money. Uh, and I think it's just such the wrong metric to look at, uh, because raising a lot of money means that somebody in the company, usually the CEO is really good at telling the story about why this can be a very big company. But every time you raise money, you're increasing the pressure onto the rest of the team. You're increasing the goals. You're moving the goalposts back. You're making it harder on the company to, to be successful. Uh, and that's fine if you have a rocket ship like, uh, I don't know, uh, Starlink and, and Tesla or something like that, right? Like a SpaceX. Sure. Great. Um, and it doesn't fit every business, but um, when you have companies um, that are more venture backed and still trying to be, you know, 10 X, maybe even 20 X investments uh, for these, the, the pressure is still there. And so um, operating under these restrictions that are saying you need to grow really fast, but not spend um, very high um, and, and be efficient in that growth gain customers while not losing customers because you're gaining them so fast that you're not paying attention to the ones that you have. Um, it, it's, uh, it's like a beautiful juggling act. And, you know, I was fortunate enough at Resi to, uh, to be there from, from the early days, um, you know, and then I left prior to, to the exit. It was really close to that time when, when the exit happened. Um, and in those moments, in those times when you do see an exit and, the pieces of paper that say they have option that that you have options become actual money and liquidity. Um, man, that is special. And those moments are just like um, they're worth it. They make all of the pressure and all of that worth it. Uh, you know, it, it's um, it's just a, a wonderful kind of um, structure yeah. by which to yeah. learn how to run run and be a yeah. business person. I mean, they are the exception, not the rule. Most of them don't. That, that, that doesn't happen. I you know I think the the biggest um, the biggest difference when you start to take venture capital is to your point, it is just an absolute expectation that there's an outsized return, that there's an asymmetrical mm -hmm. return on capital. And that, you know, you look, it, it, it's not enough to build a great product and a great company. There has to be an outsized return. And you, you look at a company like Pitch. I don't know if you heard recently. This it's a we we use it all the time. It's an incredible like app for creating presentations online and collaborating on them and sharing cool. them. Um, the the founder uh, and CEO is a, an incredible founder, incredible CEO. He was just ousted, um, and mm. they raised an insane amount of capital. I think they raised like a hundred million dollars, something like that. And um, it's an incredible product, but they weren't growing fast enough. They had to, you know had to downsize, and it's still an incredible product. Um, but you know to, you know it's it's a it's exactly what you're saying. Like you, you set yourself up for these big growth expectations, and um, there's there's not that many companies that can grow at that level for that long and and reach yeah. that you know that pinnacle, um, and at least at that you know with that amount of like time constraint and resource constraint. Yeah. Um, and, so and let, it, me, let me let me let me add to that. I mean, like I there's this there's this one thing that's kind of a maybe something not a lot of people talk about. I know that the, the, the group in Pavilion does often, which is like, are you a venture business? You know, um, great if you can, if you're not a venture business and you run it like not a venture business, but when you try to run a not venture business, like a venture business, you will fail often. Okay. And, um, and, and there's, there's nothing wrong with not being a venture business. And I'm not saying to be a lifestyle business either, but 
uh, we live at a time when there are a variety of different swim lanes for bet for capital, okay, uh, which include this new category that I've learned a lot about called uh, growth equity, not private equity, not venture capital, but growth equity, these people that live in the middle, and their investment profile is not I need one of these 10 companies to succeed 100x. Now think about that. The person who is investing in you sometimes, and you know, shout out to all the VCs, love you guys, please send us money. Okay, I'll send you equity, it's cool. But some philosophies are, I want one of these 10 companies to be 100x, and the rest, I want them to either get to 100 or die trying. Right? No, that, um, that, right. that, it's not some, I mean, that the, the parallel is just part of the innately part of, 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 of venture capital. And it's, it's, it's how the model works is they're putting, they're putting a significant amount more capital than you would typically get. And the model works because of the power law, because one of these 100 companies will have an incredibly outsized return that will, as they say, return the fund, right? So if you have a $500 yes. million dollar fund and you're gonna deploy that capital towards X amount of businesses, one of those businesses should return, you know, any one of those businesses is, is intended to return the $500 million, which means that if they exit at 10% equity and it's a $500 million fund, then you know, you need 5 billion and in, in your, yep. your exit needs to be a $5 billion exit. So clearly, you know, if they make a hundred investments, they know, you know, not every one of those businesses is going to come close to a billion dollars. So even a business that exits at a hundred million dollars, if you have a $500 million fund in, in theory is not necessarily a success. And so you, you can't, you can't also fault venture capital because the purpose of venture capital is to create an engine money. where like, well, I mean, yes, but I think if you, if you look at it more artistically, you know, the purpose of venture capital and aggregate in, 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 in America, at least is to, um, fast track innovation, right? It's a, it's a, it's a vehicle of, of capital that keeps moving our, like our, our economy forward because sure. before it was you could get an SBA loan, right? And you could try to get a loan from the <laughs> yeah. bank and that's how Nike did it, right? But like yeah. for the most part, it's not easy to get that. And you and, and that is a business where you need to have a cash flow business um, mm -hmm. where you need to grow very, very slow over 20 plus years. What venture capital has done is it's allowed us to sort of accelerate the innovation curve of of an aggregate of the entire you know country yeah. by deploying a lot more capital than you would typically get. and. So that's just part of the game. So it is difficult. You know, I think the one thing that I would say now having been through, you know, I've been in it for long enough is you should know that going into it. I didn't know it going into it. I, I, I learned as I went and I had some really great yeah. you know, advisors that, that, that helped. Um, but it, it does change somewhat how you run your business. You have to be very careful <laughs> not to be running a business because um, you're trying to just get to the next round, but it, it becomes a factor and it, you know, it's, it's um th there's there's definitely good and bad to it. Um, the... But think, but so think about this like dichotomy, right? The, the the partner who's made this investment in you knows the power law, right? And knows that this is the engine that they're trying. Yeah, look, I think it's very you're taking a very altruistic view. Um, I think you know a lot of people are entering the world of venture capital to make money, and if if the byproduct of that is that we push innovation in the country forward, that's great, but. Um, the real metric of their success would be how much return uh, on invested capital for the fund, right? Um, but like the advice that that partner is going to give you in a board meeting is to probably lead you more towards driving a uh, 100x exit than it is to uh, making sure that your team will continue to have jobs in 24 months. Yeah, and that, I, I, I think that's true. And by the way, I don't think that every venture capital firm, you know, is just in it because they want to drive innovation. There's, you know, th yeah. the purpose of it is, is that, is to drive innovation. And I think the, the great venture capital, capital firms know that it is very difficult to make money. And if you got into it to make money off of one investment, then you're probably not in the right business, right? Because sure. it takes an incredible amount of research and diligence and and discipline to be a good, you know, investor of, of capital in the in the venture capital world. It's like it's a very, very hard job. The fact that there's so many of them is just, you know, 
credit to that. They, there's this idea that you can make a lot of money, but it actually is very difficult to make money. It, the, the same parallel is true for venture capital firms. A very tiny percentage of the firms represent the majority of the returns of overall capital in the, you know, in the yeah. venture world. So yeah, I mean, again, people I think don't you realize, just, yeah, you just have to know what you are, know, know what you, what you're doing, getting into it. And I think most restaurants, yeah. by the way, the majority of them obviously are not there. You know, we're talking about private equity firms like an El Caterton or, a, or a work yeah. or something like that. And, and, and I think what you were saying about growth equity is, is, um, they, they, there's a similar sense of like, Hey, we want to get to know your business, um, you know, more. And that means we probably have more control, um, but you know yeah. we're going to make sure that you know we have more. We we're going to make sure that it stays alive. You know. Yeah. Look, I I mean I I I love what VC affords um, people who are entrepreneurial, like these paths to learn. Uh, you know, e even if there isn't an exit at the end of the uh, at the end of the um, uh, you know existence of that business. Um, a lot of those people go on to do other great things because they learn such great stuff. I mean, not every team wins a championship at the end of the season. Doesn't mean it's not um, it's not worthwhile. So, yeah. well, what do you see as like the biggest opportunities now? With like, the, let's just stick to just the restaurant hospitality industry. Like, you've been in this for a while. You've seen a bunch yeah. of tech. You've seen a bunch of, you know, you've been in the in, in in the restaurants too. Like, what do you see, you know, over the next ten years are the things that are like that yeah. you're most excited about? Yeah, I think the dumb answer here is AI, and I, I'm not going to say that uh, because, like, AI is basically saying air, okay, like uh, code. Um, you know, it AI is going to influence every single thing in our lives over the next ten to fifteen years, like the internet did when you and I were in high school and didn't have the internet, right? Um, or the internet was there, and it was AOL, and it was dial-up, and it was you know the whole thing, whatever. Um, so. AI is in the background, okay. Um, but what I what I think is going to be driven off of that is automation, and um, uh, you know I I'm I'm completely bullish on like uh, voice, what it would be like voice automation, voice AI. Um, good friends with the CEO of a company, Slang. They um, they are doing voice AI for full service restaurants, uh, taking a reservation, telling you hours of operations, having a conversation with a bot, which yes, that sounds perhaps to some a little bit like, I don't want to do that. But what if it was great? What if it was what, what you know, and it can get great. Um, so I'm really bullish on 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 voice AI to help restaurants uh, do some things that should be automated. Um, what else? I had, what else do you think yeah, they could other than reservations? What are some other things that the voice? Oh, AI could? gosh, drive through. Um, I mean, oh, yeah. you know, you have somebody that's sitting there just taking an order. The drive-through is uh, a big category for voice AI. Uh, my my friends at SoundHound and Converse AI and a bunch of others who are um, trying to uh, to to uh, capitalize on that marketplace. Um, you know, um, I think there are still places that take phone orders as well, right? Um, you believe it or not, uh, I don't know the the statistics exactly, but I would say probably a, th a third, twenty percent to a third of pizza orders in America is still taken over the phone. Um, you know, I know what <laughs> my local spot that's around the corner from me here, I call and I yeah. just say, I'm gonna come pick it up. They don't even take a credit card. You know, like how crazy is that? Because you know what? They'll probably sell that pizza if I don't show up. So it's yeah. fine. That, does um, that, does that then sort of carry over into kiosks as well then? No, oh, so it's interesting. I, I think that there is a little bit, uh, of, uh, of a carryover. We, we are, uh, friendly with a number of the, the, the voice, uh, AI companies because maybe one day that should be on a kiosk so I can walk up and talk to it. Um, uh, you know, there's some things right now that are limiting there, like ambient noise and, uh, having a direct conversation with a, a directional microphone and things like that, uh, that might get in the way. Uh, but if you think about, uh, let's say going through a drive through for a salad restaurant. Okay. Uh, you say, Hey, I'd love the Caesar salad in, you know, um, uh, having a screen there along with the voice AI makes so much sense because you can, the, the voice AI may say back. Hey, what else would you like in your salad? And put up twenty different options, mm -hmm. and you can go gr touch three of them, or even say three of them. Who knows? Whatever is the, is the easier experience for you. Um, so I think a combination of touch plus voice is what makes sense, uh, rather than saying you can put cashews, you can put almond slices, you can put you know uh, walnuts. You know, okay, like just put the options up in front of me and let me choose. Um, so I'm bullish on voice AI. Um, I had the opportunity to go see uh, Steve L's new restaurant, Colonel, in um, in Manhattan, uh, 23rd and Park or 24th and Park. 
Um, pretty incredible where the world of robotics is going for the back of house. I think we're in the very early days of it. Um, I, I was reflecting on that experience today and it didn't, I'll tell you what, it did feel great to be in the restaurant. It was cool. It was really cool, but like, um, it didn't make me feel the warm and fuzzies of being in a restaurant, which you can feel in a quick service restaurant or a fast casual restaurant. You don't have to be in 11 Madison Park. Uh, you know, to to feel uh, fancy. Oh, by the way, the Will Gadara love Madison Park, not the current iteration of it, by the way. But, um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, you don't have to you don't have to um, make make something, uh, you know, um, high end to make make it feel special. And I think I think Steve Ells will figure it out. God, I, that guy knows more about restaurants than, than I'll ever learn. OK, um, as the founder of Chipotle and, and being wildly connected in the new in, in the restaurant industry. Um, but his, you know, walking into that restaurant, um, it's pretty cool to see the machine and see the whole operation and see everything kind of made by a uh, mechanical arm. Um, and yet it just doesn't have the warm and fuzzies yet. It'll get there. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I'd love to know if there is anything else that you would like to share with this audience of chefs, restaurant <laughs> operators. You know, you know that you know you know the audience. Um, yeah, you, you know what? I I I didn't until this moment. I was going to say, nah, I don't have anything. But um, one thing that I I think everybody should know, especially look at this point, I know more about restaurant technology than I know about being in a restaurant. Okay, I've spent more years doing it. Um, but when you are in a restaurant and you're buying technology, there are two things I think you should absolutely do before buying technology. Number one, you should look at a, a technology company's Glassdoor page and you should look at how people are treated in that company. I find it, if you look this up for some of the companies that are out there and we know the names, you'll really easily suss out who are the people who are running uh, an organization that doesn't care about others and who who is running an organization that does care about its people. And why is that important? Because it's important to you, restaurateur. You care about your people. You care about your guests. At the end of the day, that's who's going to end up being the recipient of either technology or technology products. And how could you put stuff in front of them that wasn't made by people who care about other people? That's one. Secondarily, um, there should be a, a really strong distinction between operators and and CEOs and and entrepreneurs like Josh and myself and others who have spent their life dedicated to making restaurants better, uh, both from being in operations, being a chef in your case, uh, to now uh, doing technology companies versus the people who swoop in for five years, think that they're going to come in with some new fancy thing, make restaurants better, and then swoop out. Um, and if you if you don't know the difference, if you don't know their background, look up the LinkedIn of the founders of the company to see if they are um, people who are dedicated to this. Because I see off so often people that are telling a great story about the about this, and this is how you're going to make money, make things better. And when it doesn't work, they just can jet to some other industry. They don't care. People like Josh and I are going to be in this industry for the rest of our lives. Um, God bless our souls, uh, you know, and and the reality is, is that I have to be honest with you because my next company is going to be in this and my next company is going to be in this and I'm going to be in restaurants. I'm going to be in this forever. And these other folks can say whatever they want because they don't care. They can burn the relationship with you. So I think those two things are more important than whether the product's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that, man. I love it. I, <laughs> I, 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 good, 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 uh, good advice. Um, and also just always nice to catch up with you on a call. You too, brother. Um, uh, I thank you so much for having me on. I've been listening to, to many of these and uh, been jealous. So uh, I got, I got my